Well, the first law in educating genteel folks today is to get them ready to make a living. This comes before almost anything. If grandmother was in college today, she would probably uh, be either taking secretarial work, bookkeeping, she might be doing specialty in librarian work, or she might be preparing to be a school teacher. These are the types of things we are more concerned with now. Well, probably we have to be. There's no sense in denying the fact that the economic problem presses in upon gentility just as much as upon any other level of our society. But out of it all, we have lost something that I think we should reconsider. It's no longer possible to build some of these values into our education at a formal period of training, but we can build those things which have been discarded or overlooked into our mature life by intent and purpose. Now, the uh, gentility of grandmother could be paralleled a little bit by the gentility of grandfather, for it was quite obvious that uh, a man uh, belonging to that period, expecting to live in a home under such conditions, must also have a certain amount of gentility of his own. So while he was in business, business rested rather lightly on his shoulders. Uh, he had the dignity for business, if not the aptitude. He did fairly well, and uh, everyone was uh, reasonably happy about the whole thing. He was able to accomplish that which was considered essential in his time, namely that all his children were enabled to have two years of musical education in Europe. This constituted a well-balanced life. This is the way people thought things through. For his own creativity, uh, grandfather went into religion very heavily and became an outstanding authority in his day on St. Paul. Now, at the time when he was running a fairly successful business, he was also devoting a great deal of time to the study of Greek and Latin and the efforts to interpret early biblical history, which was very close to his interest. This type of family is becoming more and more rare. And we may say that... Uh, Life with father, as Clarence Day called it, had also its drawbacks. It certainly did. But we did not have nearly the amount of stress and strain in our relationships at that time uh, that we have now. And uh, while people could have difficult temperaments, and there were certainly many uh, tyrannical families, at the same time, most people had some creative outlet. And that is the point we are particularly interested in trying to stress. That in our gradual acceptance of what we might term pressure civilization, we have come gradually to neglect those things uh, which could not immediately be fitted into the survival pattern. Life has become very largely a matter of devoting our energies to those things which we regard as necessary to success. And our definition of success is practically economic advancement. Thus we become a very lonely people. And the more successful we become, the more lonely we have to be. We're apt to be. Instead of success giving us an opportunity to do the things that are in our hearts we want to do, success finds us with nothing in our hearts that we want to do. This takes a great deal of the edge off of success. Uh, I talked to a rather successful man not long ago, as we call it today, and he said, I have everything that I want, but I, there's nothing that I really want. There is nothing important standing out to justify the tremendous struggle that we have made to accumulate certain things in this world. Instead of building toward a purpose, we make the actual accumulation the purpose itself. Instead of our various labors being means to some end that we desire, the very processes become ends in themselves. And as a result, uh, we find that the more successful we become, the less interesting we really are. Now, I don't know that too many of us are desperately concerned over trying to moderate success. I don't think that the average person is so successful that this is bothering him. But it is true that all the way along, even in the most uh, moderate situations, 
there seems to be a lack of overtones, and life is largely composed of overtones. As these fade out, we begin to get more and more of the starkness with which we face daily living today. Everything is so realistic, everything is so practical and inevitable, that the individual not only has very little to interest him, but almost nothing to think about. That is, anything worthwhile. In the old days, we got a great deal of creativeness out of labor. Most uh, men, particularly, found their self-expression in their work. And this self-expression was perhaps humble, but very dramatic in itself. Uh, in the old days, when a man went out, got land, began to cultivate, his property. He had a very big job on his hands. He was building a way of life in the wilderness. He had to make nearly everything that he needed himself. Maybe once or twice a year he sent in to one of these uh, great sales companies that sent their catalogs out and he ordered what he needed for the year. But for the most part he had to devise ways. He had to find ways to bring water to his land. He had to find ways to get rid of the rocks and boulders that interfered with the harvest. He had to find ways to build his own house. These were things that people did. And as a result of that, they had a certain ingenuity continually operating. The same was true in the older days of our small cottage industry. In the small town, the shoemaker was a man of ingenuity. He had all kinds of problems. He had not only to repair shoes, but to make them. He had the right, like the Gilmasters of Nuremberg, to take a great pride in the things that he did. The same was true in the building uh, crafts and trades. These things represented continually individual problems. Today, these problems are largely forgotten. And more and more, the whole problem of maintenance is replacement. Don't fix anything, just throw it out and get another one. There is no longer any ingenuity no effort to economize, no effort to preserve good products. As a result, almost all of the arts and trades have lost their creative value to the individual. They no longer challenge him. They are no, he is no longer challenged by the time clock. He becomes part of some large industry. Someone else does all his thinking for him. Any individuality is apt to be penalized. Even in matters of religion, we find this continual pressure of conformities. It's not very interesting even anymore to be a really uh, a heterodox thinker. The individual simply finds little opportunity for the development of his own creativity even in religion. Reading has largely disappeared from our people, uh, except for a small group of really serious thinkers. For the rest, reading has become too difficult. It is too arduous, especially when you've never been taught how to spell. As a result of that, you turn to picture publications, because anybody can spell a picture. Now, in the old days, the picture way of reading was set forth in beautiful form in McGuffey's Reader. And in McGuffey's Reader, you learned that when you were about six or seven years old, it was better to use pictures uh, for ideas than it was words. And gradually, you learned the words that were associated with the picture. Today, for some reason, that which was fashionable for the kindergarten and the first two grades of grammar school now becomes the mature method of securing an education. In other words, we look at world events. We don't read about them. We look at what is happening. And the most successful publications we have today have a minimum of text and a maximum of pictures. We are finding this more and more in technical books. In my own field of interest, for example, uh, we hear that there's a new publication coming out on some advanced theme. We'll take, for example, symbolism, which to me is a very interesting subject. So we look the book over, and what do we find? We have 212 pages of pictures and 8 pages of text. And anything that you want isn't in the text. And the more you read it, you more, the more you realize that you only have eight pages of text because the author didn't know what he was talking about and was able to generalize to the extremity of his knowledge in eight pages. This situation, again, denies us certain activity. Uh, we, do not, uh, we do not have the experience of the kind of thoughtfulness that we once found so intriguing. 
Many is the long winter evening with an uh, old-fashioned kerosene lamp that the great classics of the world were read by thoughtful people. This is too much work now. We, uh, we're interested in the digest version. The more digested, the better. If it is entirely digested and nothing is left, then this we will pay for, because we simply do not want the kind of work that is implied. In uh, almost every field of our artistic expression, we've become listeners. Uh, we no longer really make any desperate effort uh, to create something. When our friends who are interested in music come in for the evening, we turn on the hi-fi or produce some equipment that costs several thousand dollars, and everyone has an enchanting evening. Now, this has its advantages, certainly. For the first time, perhaps, great music comes into the home of the average person. But with all of this, we have developed nothing but ears. We have developed no actual sense of participation. We do not create. We simply absorb that which is created by others. This lack of the personal involvement in creativity takes everything out of fact and into theory. Uh, philosophy and religion both have emphasized from the beginning that the only way in which man can grow is by experience. Well, of course, listening is an experience. There's no question about that. But listening is a different kind of experience from participating. Listening is not the full experience or the full joy or the full satisfaction that comes to the individual who releases something from inside himself. The whole theory of philosophy is based upon release. It is based upon the individual moving from his own internal out into a world of personal self-expression. This road that leads from the internal out is a broad highway. It is a road along which many basic ideas have to travel. It is the road in which, uh, along which consciousness moves into manifestation. It is the road in which inner growth is made possible, a road by which all theory is tested by application, and that which is not able to sustain itself in application is allowed to rest for the moment and not dominate our way of life. All around us we observe a world of untested theories, a world in which even those theories that are tested are not thought through. The power to think things through to their reasonable ends, uh, this power has been neglected. If at the turn of the century, if in the last 50 years, scientifically trained persons who developed high exactitudes of method had also had the power to think things through they would undoubtedly have been more cautious in launching upon the world forms of knowledge which could be so easily perverted and could so easily lead to the general destruction of human security. But with their minds totally upon one idea, with no perspective, with no sense of the unfolding pattern of things, uh, these individuals went along like moles underground, working in darkness and totally unaware that what we do must have consequences and that we must ultimately live with these consequences. And any uh, way of life which does not recognize this is immature. And any uh, system of education which does not teach it is inadequate. Yet we have gone on our way, and from the examples of the leaders of our way of life, the average person has been over-influenced until today uh, we simply have lost the knack of thinking things through to their consequences and planning our own living accordingly. We've lost this creative skill. Now it is true that perhaps in many areas of activity, creativity does not seem to be terribly important. It wouldn't seem to be very essential to the individual that finding a piece of equipment broken down, and perhaps being unable to get replacement, 
he begins to think in terms of repairing this thing himself. This will require some thoughtfulness. It will require some skill also. Perhaps he may have to do what his ancestor did, uh, file and cut an entirely new part out of a piece of base metal. But this type of ingenuity is constantly calling upon resource. It is causing the individual to move something out from within himself. It causes him to be a little better disciplined. If he doesn't make this replacement properly, it won't fit. The haphazard, inadequate type of work uh, which we have developed in recent years is simply part of this pattern of the person not moving adequately from his own resources. There is no doubt in the world that we are all a resourceful people, but we are neglecting this to a very sad degree. As we lose the idea, the basic concept of moving from within ourselves, our spiritual and philosophical values are also slighted. Today the world is filled with groups of people following somebody. Uh, these groups of people do not really know where they are going, most of them. They do not know the real value of the thing they are following. But it is easier to follow and accept than it is to think. And as a result, many very unfortunate situations arise in which uh, persons become involved in ideas which are not practical, which are not useful, and have no virtue perhaps except a little immediate glamour. But uh, not thinking, not being able to experience through things, we are gullible. And the more gullible we are, the more we will suffer, the more we will hurt ourselves and perhaps injure others in the same procedure. So we like to feel very definitely that creativity is important, that creativity gives us the habit of solving problems. The creativity gives us the habit of self-expression. We can say that perhaps self-expression is possible without creativity. It is. But then there is always the danger that such types of self-expression will lead to destructivity instead of creativity. The individual who has no pattern behind his action has really no way of contributing a positive value to anything. So it is not just enough to do something. This something must have meaning. It must be under some censorship and some discrimination. And day by day these powers weaken in us until we become very largely victims of the pressures of conformity and thoughtlessness. So in our field of interest, certainly, the reward goes to the person who is able to do something and do it well. To do something with a philosophy of life means to discriminate. We are all surrounded by ideas, some of them good, some of them bad. There are ideas that work for other people but not for us. And somewhere along the line we have to get over this idea that everyone is so much alike that patterns can be imposed upon individuals and that almost anyone can successfully follow the same pattern. In the area of medicine we know this is not true. We know that unless the individual uh, is understood, unless various tests are made, it is not safe to medicate him. Uh, he may not react as his neighbor does. And this idea of exchanging recipes over the back fence may or may not produce anything very constructive. But we know that the human being is an individual. And to the degree that we impose upon this individual complete conformity, we destroy in him self-expression, and we gradually destroy in him the incentive to be a person. Most of our neurotics are people who have lost this incentive or never had it. And creativity is the greatest solution uh, to the negative attitudes of people. Creativity is the one answer to self-boredom. It is a very powerful answer to self-pity. It is a wonderful panacea for worry. 
and uh, worry and boredom and self-pity are the common ailments of our time. We may add to this group another, fear. Fear is, of course, something always difficult to work with. But fear grows and enlarges where we have no adequate internal mental emotional life. Busy people have very little time to be afraid. But you cannot be so busy doing unimportant things that you can overcome the neurotic tendencies merely by activity, unless this activity is meaningful. Meaningful activity must be that which is supported by the psychic content in ourselves. We term enjoyment uh, the problem or the process of appreciating and gaining pleasure from what we do. According to the level of our own insight, this pleasure standard changes. We are not necessarily pleasure seekers in the same way that Aristippus was. We are not looking for pleasure merely as gratification of sensory perception or sensory appetites. But pleasure must come from some internal motion or quality by which we gain satisfaction from what we do. And this kind of pleasure encourages us to greater and greater personal activity. We look around among people, particularly those who seem to have more than their share of problems, and we find that for the most part they are persons whose personal creativity is inadequate. They may be busy people, they may be well-intentioned people, but they have never made a conscious link with their own subjective life. As a result, when they become quiet, when they try to relax, there is no constructive mental activity to take over and to make sure that these people enjoy self-expression. You give persons in these problems opportunities uh, to express themselves and they are largely bewildered. Today, the individual on his own is bewildered. He will immediately take refuge in some collective. He is afraid to attempt the quiet, secure effort at self-expression. Or he becomes belligerent, affirming that to express himself means merely to differ with things as they are. So we have a vast body of complainers it's per perfectly right for an individual to recognize the weaknesses of a society around him. I can understand why he is not overly happy at some of the candidates for public office. It's quite understandable that he is not satisfied with the policy policies of his employers. It's also quite true that he may be dissatisfied with the education and religion of his time. That there are real reasons for dissatisfaction, we know. But dissatisfaction, per se, is no solution to a problem. There are reasons why we should be dissatisfied, but there are even greater and more pressing reasons why we should use our ob observation to lead to some constructive action of our own. It's quite true that our dissatisfaction, unless it becomes a mass movement, may have very little political significance. But it is also true that dissatisfaction must lead us to a constructive effort to correct in our own lives that with which we are dissatisfied. There's simply no use of complaining. Complaining as such is now regarded more or less as a status symbol. If we are dissatisfied, we are intellectuals, because it is essential that all intellectual people be thinkers. And the first and only formula for thinking that we know at the moment is, gentlemen, I disagree. This is a sign that we really have done some heavy work. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't mean anything. Dissatisfaction, however, brings a certain social, psychic contact. We immediately move into a group with similar dissatisfactions and incorporate. Then we have an opportunity to spend a certain number of hours daily or weekly or monthly from that time on dissatisfying with other people. We can go on and on and on with this procedure, but we haven't accomplished anything. 
the moment the individual observes that something is wrong, the question is, to what degree is he cooperating with this thing that is wrong? To what degree is he under the same hypnosis? To what degree is he using complaint as an evasion in, in the place of action? In our matters of complaining, presuming that we have legitimate complaint, presuming, for example, that we disagree with a certain legislation, uh, we assume at the moment that our big answer is to vote against it. But what have we in the form of self-creative solution to this problem? It may be that we will never have an opportunity to apply any solution that we may have. But an individual complaining should always have a constructive uh, answer in his own consciousness for that against which he complains. A complaint should be a stimulation to intellectual effort and not merely uh, a continual habitual dissatisfaction. If an individual says, I think this is wrong, we have a right to ask him, then what do you think is right? And we should get a straight answer. And that's where we never get it. Very often we will get an answer, uh, probably uh, which arises in a moment of desperation. It was never thought of until we asked the question. But then, in order to defend self against the humiliating uh, fact of being required to say, I don't know, we begin to come up with something. And very often, the solution we have is worse than the problem we attack. Actually, our own solution, if applied to the problem, would be meaningless. Consequently, we haven't thought it through. And this is one of the great matters of, of existence. Why do we live here? Why have we been taken out of some, uh, at least theologically defined, paradisical abode, uh, which we uh, uh, were cast out of because of an unhappy addiction to apples? In this, um, in this situation, why are we here? Are we really here to be dissatisfied? Are we here to be complacent? Are we here to ignore the whole problem and make a few dollars? If there is any reason to be here, it would seem to me that it is, we are here to learn something. We do not learn by accepting or rejecting. We do not uh, learn by ignoring. We do not learn by collapsing in a sense of total helplessness. If there's something here that we need to know, the only way to find out is to use the powers that we have to reason through a situation and find the answer. Now, occasionally we do this, but not as often as we should. And we divide the problem of answer into two very broad areas. Cross-sections by polling of the American people and reports based upon letters which are received by the White House and other centers of government would indicate that from the people have come and are still flowing many important ideas. It may not be entirely fair to say that all of these ideas are ignored. It is also perhaps not quite fair to say that all of these ideas coming from persons unacquainted usually with the specifics of the problem can be immediately applied. But there has been an observable fact namely that thousands of people have had good ideas about how things could be improved. They are, however, a very small minority of the population. But this fact does stand out, that where the person is perhaps only indirectly involved, where the consequences of a policy will not be felt on his own skin, the person does have better ideas. He is less personal. He has no immediate benefit to himself to consider. He is not going to be instantly involved in an argument over his idea. 
So he writes it in, or telegraphs it in, and because it comes from a certain impersonality within himself, it is often very constructive. But when he has an idea about himself, about his own family, about the environment in which he lives, about the management of personal affairs, it is much harder for him to have a constructive idea. This is because he must fight through this tremendous complex of his own personal opinions and attitudes. Against his ideas will be arraigned all of his prejudices, all of his opinions and conceits, his traditional pressures, and a large amount of mental and emotional fatigue. All this centers on his effort to solve his own problem. So we give excellent advice to strangers and keep none of it ourselves. We know that everyone else should live together in brotherly love, but we can't get along with anybody. We know that religion is a wonderful thing for other people, and that if they would live it better, we would be happier. What we're going to do about it is still very dim. Consequently, uh, we must work more carefully and more thoughtfully in the effort to get creativity out of our own subconscious and into our own personal conscious behavior. And we have to start some way. It is not reasonable to hope that we can probe inside of ourselves and bring out immediately a Plato or an Aristotle. We have to work with this internal allotment bringing it into manifestation and exercising it gradually until it is strong enough uh, to carry major decisions. But we cannot get anywhere by simply ignoring it. We can accomplish nothing by going along, refusing and rejecting every impulse which might lead us to the investigation of our own inner life. Today, the inner life of man is being forced upon us by outward circumstances. The only area in which man can hope for integration is in himself. The only place where he's ever going to find constructive answers which can sustain him in time of trouble will be in his own nature. Institutions and organizations can contribute something, but the most that they can contribute is a greater incentive to continue this personal investigation of self for the purpose of discovering just how much strength there is in there. We know there's plenty of weakness on the outside, and the remedy that we recommend for this is to test the strength on the inside. Most persons who have made a, a sincere and honest test of this strength have been pleasantly surprised. They have discovered that the human being does possess within himself an almost inexhaustible reservoir of potential power. The individual is capable of solving his own problem. He is able to solve it in the only way that justice can be found in nature. If the solution to all human problems rested with collectives or rested with isolated individuals in places of authority, there could be no honesty in the universe. There could be no justice if an individual's personal destiny is not in some way immediately under his own control. If he is the victim of others, if he is the victim of the generation in which he lives, if he is the victim of the collective fear of his time, then there can be no essential merit system in space. It would appear that we are in this world as many of the great philosophers have pointed out, to gradually discover that the world around us is merely an agent to stimulate in us the consideration of the world within us. That the world around us only controls us to the degree that we do not control ourselves. If we wish to drift, the world is a large area of potential drifting. If we wish to trust our courses entirely to the currents of existence, we will be battered around like a ship without a rudder. If we wish to insist and affirm 
that the tides will in their own good time take us where we are supposed to go, then in many instances we discover that our proper destiny is on the rocks. This we cannot permit to dominate our thinking. Actually, uh, we, our kind of living is divided into two basic brackets. The individual who is a victim of life and the individual who is a victor over life. There can only be two such patterns. Either the person is continually troubled by the circumstances around him or he is constantly sustained by the resources within him. I think everyone would prefer to be sustained. But the trouble lies that in Western way of life we have done nothing to prepare the background uh, for the cultivation of the self-sustaining man. Nearly always there is a certain original relationship between a philosophy of life and an individual. No one can achieve tranquility of spirit for us, but there are ways in which the questing can be made easier. There is no way in which an individual can be assured that he will grow to virtuous maturity. But there are probabilities that he has a better chance of becoming a virtuous adult if he has had certain amount of conditioning in childhood. His probabilities of being an honorable citizen are increased if he comes out of an honorable home where he had proper affection, consideration, and thought, also discipline. If, therefore, the individual of today, the mature person, is seeking for a certain background for orientation. He is not so different from the person who is able to look back upon a childhood in which certain principles were clearly fixed. Today man looks back upon the childhood of Western civilization, and he does not find its principles clear or well fixed. He looks to the world around him, to determine what people believe is right, and he finds very little that is clearly directed. He looks for resources within himself, which have been trained by his opportunities, and which would naturally be available, and he finds these resources inadequate. He has not the cooperation of his culture in anything that he needs to accomplish. Instead of being able to move within a pattern of acceptances, he is apparently required to move totally alone. Now, nature undoubtedly has set this pattern for a reason. Actually, the person who must move of himself and cannot depend upon co cooperative circumstances stands in the position of making the greatest personal achievement to the degree that he is forced to make a greater effort to the same degree he achieves a greater end. But uh, this is not always easy or optimistic. So not having very much cultural uh, stimulation, he, uh, the Western man is in a bit of a dilemma. 300 years, 400 years ago in China, if you wanted to be a gentleman, you became a poet. If you wanted to be considered a great citizen, you became a philosopher. And if you wish to be the highest type of desirable person, you became a mystic. These were the great honored levels. Today in our Western way of life, if you want to be acceptable on the best intellectual levels, you must believe in nothing. Now, of course, this should apparently lead to vast acceptability, but it doesn't even do that. Even on the proper basis of our way of life, we are not accepted for our unbelief any more than we would be for our believing. The reason why is there is no standard. There is nothing that is regarded as admirable. The only standard is a standard of success on a material level. And this standard is too brittle, too immature, to have any very constructive suggestions to make relating to the personal culture of the individual. Therefore, we do not have uh, the cultural pattern which might cause our young people to say, 
that I would like to be a really fine person, and that means that I have to be a thoughtful, constructive, idealistic citizen. This is not the incentive pattern under which we live. Lacking this incentive pattern, therefore, we are not only left without the incentive, but we are also left without the pattern. We are left with the average person unable to, to determine for himself what he should do. He cannot find enough evidence in contemporary situations as to how he can live a constructive, successful life. We still do have available to us the great religious systems of the past and the great idealistic philosophical systems. But the average person today is not equipped to make the transposition of time that is necessary. We are unable to take a, a religion like Christianity and simply apply it wholeheartedly to the 20th century. We are unable to break through medieval tradition and we try to impose it upon the modern world. In attempting to correct this, we ultimately become so confused that we are unable to use the religious factor uh, constructively. Little by little, we see that uh, several hundred years of declining ideality, several hundred years of drifting away from ethical and cultural foundations has, uh, have resulted in a sort of derelict state. We have no clear insight as to how to start a constructive pattern of self-expression. We can't, we can't borrow from available uh, resources, nor can we simply go to school somewhere and learn it. It's a problem where each person has to think it through for himself. This is again more difficult than in ancient times. Because remember, 2,000 years ago, 5% of the population uh, alone was capable of involvement in the mature problems of life as we know them today. For the rest, life had to remain an exceedingly simple problem. Some of this simplicity was extremely good. Some of it, however, was, uh, was inadequate. But with a small group of people, also mostly trained in homo homogeneous culture, philosophy and religion had a far greater opportunity of exercising influence than they have today. Today, the average person is too well educated, has too much uh, contact with diversified cultural factors to be able to quickly differentiate that which he immediately needs. This becomes a further matter of confusion. Also, uh, the problems which we face are more complicated than those which were faced a uh, thousand or two thousand years ago. Our own value senses changed in this period of time and we require a different kind of solution from our ancestor. But we have not clarified what kind of solution we mean. So assuming that we have reached the age in which solution becomes necessary and we cannot immediately turn to any available source for this solution, we have to begin to work through various plans and devices of our own in an effort to discover that which will most rapidly advance our own maturity.